Now that we know how to find the critical T values, we're ready to find the confidence interval for a single population mean, mu. Right, mu is the population mean, which we don't know what it is, but we're going to make a guess for what it is based on x bar, the sample mean. Speaking of which, that sample mean is our point estimate. It's our single best guess. So the x bar is the center of our intervals. You can see it in the formulas right here. So these are the formulas up here. So the formulas are right there. And then we have this point estimate, x bar, plus or minus, and then this whole back bit is the margin of error. Right? Same thing here, point estimate, plus or minus, margin of error. It's just that this one writes out what the standard error is. The standard error we learned in section 8.1 is s over the square root of n, and I, you can either write standard error or you can write s over the square root of n. So they're basically the same thing. Right? So they're both valid formulas, it's just use whichever one you want. All right, so our critical t value, of course, is t alpha over 2. The degrees of freedom is n minus 1, never forget. Right? n minus 1 is your degrees of freedom. And our point estimate is x bar. And the margin of error is the back half of that. So it's point estimate plus or minus margin of error. As a matter of fact, I'll just remind you, right? the basic formula for a confidence interval, we learned about it in section 9.1, but I'll say it again, is point estimate plus or minus margin of error. That's how we get the lower and the upper, right? That is the confidence interval. And the point estimate is in the middle of it. Right? That's how that works. Okay, so let's do it, all right, for the big problem. Don't we love it? Oh, and of course, I should mention that all of this is predicated on the fact that we have to have our requirements, our conditions met, otherwise we can't do any of it. Um, that goes without saying, because we've been doing that a lot lately. All right, so researchers at the Bostrom Maternity and Children's Hospital reported in, 2015, in a 2015 study that from a random sample of 160 sickles, um, child sickle cell anemia patients, their average length of stay in the hospital was 4.34 days with a standard deviation of 2.85 days. You want to construct a 90% confidence interval for the mean length of stay for child sickle cell anemia patients. All right, so you're trying to construct a confidence interval for the mean. Right, which means you're in this section. Now, the first thing we're going to do is verify our conditions, our requirements. Same thing. So we want random. All right, I'm assuming I wrote it in there somewhere. Um, let's see here. Random sample. Let's set it right here. Okay, so that's given. Good. We like that. Easy. Step two, independent. Okay, so we've got to prove this one. I mean, it's going to be yes, but we got to know why. So we need little n to be less than 0.05 capital N. So little n is 160. It's right here. Right? That's little n. So 160, 0.05. Now we were not given a capital N on this one. So we'll just have to write what it would be, which would be all child sickle cell patients. Well, there's a lot of them, right? So um, unfortunately, sickle cell anemia is, is a extensive disease and has a lot of people that have it, especially children. So this is going to be, of course it is, right? Of course, this is so large, this number, whatever this is, that 160 will be less than 0.05 of all of the patients of that, right? The all is key there. So we're just gonna have to make that argument and leave it. We don't know the full number. Normal, well, normal is easier in this section than it is in 9.1 because we just need n to be bigger than 30 or a graph given. Well, there's no graph given, but I do have n, which is 160 is bigger than 30. So we're good. The weirdest one, of course, is that independent piece. Um, if we're given the number, we put it in, right? If we know what capital N is, the population size, we can put it in. If we don't know the population size, we can kind of talk about what it would be and say, well, of course, that's going to be really big. So we're okay. 
Next, we're going to construct a 90% confidence interval. So, formula. Well, I could use either one, the one on the left or the one on the right, but I don't know the standard error. I haven't calculated it, so I'm going to use the one on the right. That's the, the one on the right's the one we use the most often, I should say. It's the same as um, section 9.1. The one on the left is for our own benefit, as it's true, but um, the one on the right is the one we actually end up using most of the time. Remember that the alpha over 2 is not a multiplication. It's actually just a subscript. Um, you can skip writing it if you want and just say t. It's fine. All right, so that's the formula. Then the substitution, where all the big points are. OK, x bar. Well, let's see. We've got to read through this. x bar was given to us somewhere in here. Let's look. So x bar is a mean. Um, just I'll just remind everybody. X bar is the sample mean. All right, that's what it stands for which was right here, 4.34. So that's x bar. So it's 4.34 plus or minus, oops, gotta switch back to my other color, plus or minus. The t, I'm just gonna leave a space and I'll be back for that. And I know the n is 160, so that one's good. S, I need the standard deviation. So let's look up in there somewhere. It's right here, standard deviation, that's s. And I'll just remind you, S is the sample standard deviation. That's what S stands for. So it'll be 2.85. Now I just have to find the T. Okay, well, the T is the T that goes with a 90% confidence interval, but with the degrees of freedom of 159. So I'll just make a little note over the side. Um, degrees of freedom is 160, take away 1, which is 159. Okay, so why do I need that? Well, because I need stack crunch, right? The way to get the t value is what we just did on the previous page. So we got to go stat, calculators, t. We click between. We put in our degrees of freedom, which is 159. And we put in our area, which is 0.9 compute. And there we get it, 1.6545. And I'll just make a little note. Um, the t alpha over 2, find with stack crunch. Right, see previous page. <laughs> see previous page, because we just did. All right, now you could go type all that in. Um, it's fine, but we can just find the result with StatCrunch. Um, I'm, I'm going to write my path. Hold on, let me write my StatCrunch path. This. So we actually have to use stack crunch twice. We use it once to find the t, right? That's with the t, right? Stat calculator's t. And then we find the result with stat t stat one sample. And then we have to choose either with data or with summary. So if I look at this particular problem, I don't have the data. Right? So I can't use data. I'm going to have to use with summary. So stat, t stat, one sample with summary on this one. All right, so I'm going to enter my values, which was 4.34 and then 2.85 and then 160. I want to click confidence interval. I want to put in the confidence I wanted, which was 90. And if you want a plot, you can have a plot, but it doesn't mean anything. And there we have it. So the lower and the upper are right there. There's your degrees of freedom, 159. There's your standard error. I can tell you, by the way, if you want to see the critical value, you can actually check the box right there and it'll give you the t value as well. There it is. Same thing we had on the previous page. 
or the previous um, window here. Right there. See? So it's the same thing. That's just a checkbox you can check in there if you want to. So and if you want to avoid doing the stat calculators T, you can do it that way instead. All right, so we had to do with summary on this one, with summary, because we didn't have a data set. And if you want to see the T, you just click the checkbox that says critical T value, because that's the critical value. All right, so we got the values. It was 3.9672, 3.9672, and 4.7123. Or one two, one two eight. There we go. Four point seven one two eight. And both of those are days, by the way. So for the unit for them, they'd be days. So or days. Suppose the Basra Hospital chief claims that a majority of sickle cell anemia patients take less than 4.5 days to recover. Does the confidence interval support or contradict their claim? Okay, so let's let's read that a little bit. The claim that they're making is that they patients take less than 4.5 days. So this is the claim, right? Less than 4.5. So now let's draw a picture of our interval. Our interval goes from 3.9672, and it has 4.34 here in the middle, up to, oh, that wasn't quite the middle, <laughs> sorry, there it is, okay, and then this is 4.7128, and our interval is everything between, right, it's all of those values. Okay, so you have to ask yourself, is your entire interval below 4.5? So they're claiming less than 4.5. Is your entire interval less than 4.5? Well, it's not. 4.5 isn't here. You have a bit that's above that 4.5. So that's a contradict, right? It, your interval is not supporting. It's contradicting because a part of the interval is above 4.5, particularly the upper limit, <laughs> I guess. And if I want to be specific about it, the upper limit of the interval. I can just say this. Okay. That's why. Because the upper limit, which was 4.7128, right, of the interval is above 4.5. Oh, drive me nuts. Here we go. The upper limit of the interval, which is 4.7128, is above 4.5. There we go. I like that better. And I said this when we ran into this before in chapter, section 9.1. You need your entire interval to be where they're claiming to support, right? Supporting is actually kind of tricky. To support, your whole interval has to be where they say. But your whole interval isn't where they say. A lot of your intervals where they say, but not all of it. There's this bit over here on the top that's higher than 4.5, so that's a contradict.